All right, so part two of occupational adaptation, um, we're going to talk a little bit more about um, how the person and the environment interact. And so, um, as we talked about in part one, um, the person and the environment are the constants, um, as well as the interaction element that occurs between the two. So the interaction of the person, um, all people want to do good, right? Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, oh, I don't really want to do good today. Um, so everybody has this desire to do well, this desire to master. Um, and then on the environment, the environment always places demands upon us. Um, and so we want to do well, but we have these demands to overcome that are put in front of us by our environment. And so the two um, create a press. Um, this press for mastery presents as a challenge or an occupational challenge, um, which emerges from our roles and possibly our role expectations. So kind of giving you a visual, this is the middle part of your diagram. Um, we have the interaction between the person and the environment, which creates a press. Um, that press creates an occupational challenge. Um, so it might be challenging for me to um, brush my teeth, okay? Um, brushing my teeth is part of my expectations for um, living in society, okay? Being a clean, hygienic person. And so that's based on um, what's expected out of me based on my roles. Um, it can be your being a brother, sister, um, student, um, worker, um, any of those things. So general assumptions um, that we can assume occup or occupational adaptation model um, talks about is how occupation is universal. Um, everybody engages in occupation. Um, OT has long identified how important occupation is as a tool for healthy participation in life, um, meaning that if we don't engage in the occupation of eating, we die. If we don't engage in the occupation of hygiene, we get sick. And so um, occupation, again, has been very, very important. Um, we talk about occupation as means and occupation as ends later, um, as in year two. Um, we talk about that quite a bit. But actually, just to kind of give you an overview, um, occupation as means, um, sometimes we just engage in occupation to engage in occupation. Um, sometimes I go fishing. Um, just to enjoy fishing. Um, I may not catch any fish. It doesn't mean I don't have any fun. Um, I'm just engaging in fishing to engage in fishing. Um, children with occupation, one of their main occupations is play. So um, children would be playing. They don't really care if they get anything out of it. They're just playing to play. They're engaging in, in play as its own means. So play would be an occupation as means. Sometimes, though, we sometimes do redundant tasks that maybe we don't like. Um, we don't have much motivation for them. Um, but that end product that we may have is that occupation that is motivating to us. So I think of um, doing hand therapy. Um, sometimes we would do scar massage. We would do ultrasound. We would do... Um, passive range of motion, we would do exercises and therapy and and the client sitting there thinking, this is hard work, this, this, you know, what's the point of this? Um, and so it would be my job to remind them that we're trying to regain range of motion um, and grip strength so that you can go fishing later, so that you can sustain grasp on a frying pan handle. Um, so we're using that um, mundane therapeutic exercise as sort of um, to get them to their um, ability to engage in that occupation. Um, so occupation has re-emerged as our core intervention method. So even though we have not, even though in hand therapy, um, we may be doing therapy and those sorts of things, we're always having conversations or I always had conversations with my client um, of the purpose of those things. Um, so we always have that occupation in mind. Um, now, occupation requires adaptation. Um, again, we're looking at, or we'll be looking at the adaptive response um, generation subprocess coming up here. And so 
we're identifying that um, in order to engage in occupation, um, we sometimes we have to adapt. Okay, when we're driving and all of a sudden it starts snowing or freezing rain, we have to adapt so that we can be competent in that functioning. So all occupations have three properties. One, they actively involve the person. So the person can't be asleep and we're doing occupation with them. Um, we are in our treatment, they, they can't just be asleep. Um, the occupation needs to be meaningful to the person. And they have to involve a process with some sort of a product. And so the product can be tangible or intangible. So when I think of an intangible product, I think of something that can't necessarily be seen. Um, so I sometimes like to go jogging or running, especially when it's warm outside. Um, and so at the end of my run, I'm not exactly going to have anything that I can physically see or feel, right? Um, but I'll feel good about myself for doing it, and it'll still be meaningful to me, and I'll still be actively involved in it. Uh, when I think of um, tangible, I think of having something that I can visibly see or touch or feel. So <clears throat> when I get hungry, I usually make myself something to eat. So I am involved in a process of gathering ingredients out of the fridge or out of the cupboard. I put them together and voila, I have a sandwich. I have something tangible that I can physically see, feel, eat. And so that occupation of um, cooking or snack prep or whatever you want to say, um, I have that tangible product that I can then later consume. So looking at the adaptive response generation subprocess, this is the picture that is just down from the person on the far left hand side of your diagram. Um, it begins with the perception that there's some sort of a challenge that occurs between the person and the environment. Okay, that's why you see all the arrows that are coming from your occupational challenge um, and then they, they um, are being placed from your person and the environment. And then that goes down to our role expectations, and then the role expectations goes back and forth between the person, um, and then that comes down to our adaptive response generation subprocess. Expectations can come from the person, um, or they can come from the environment. So <clears throat> the adaptive generation subprocess is where OT intervention needs to have the ultimate impact because what we want is for um, the occupation or for the ther or for excuse me for the person we want our client to be able to um, analyze how they're doing themselves. So there's a desire for the client to anticipate their own outcomes and to generate their own responses. Okay, so as we're working with somebody who has had a hip replacement and they're in a hospital, um, we know that they can't bend down past 90 degrees with hip flexion um, in order to put on socks, put on shoes, to start putting on their pants, okay, those sorts of things. So we teach them to use a reacher and a sock aid and long handle shoehorn and, and all those sorts of things, okay. So then they go home and they're walking with their front wheeled walker and all of a sudden they drop something, okay. We want them to be able to anticipate how they're going to problem solve that, okay? So we want them to be able to anticipate their own outcomes. Um, so, hmm, if they bend down and pick up this tissue that they dropped after a hip replacement and they bend past 90 degrees, that's not going to be good. So we want to teach our clients these things and, and hope that they can kind of anticipate their own outcomes. Now, in life, things happen, right? Um, if bad things happen or, or people have a bad outcome, um, they're going to have more of a, a masterful response. They're going to adapt, okay? And that's what this is looking at. So um, if I am making a grilled cheese sandwich, okay, and I am cooking on high like I always do because I'm always in a hurry um, and I burn my grilled cheese sandwich on one side so I flip it over I notice it's burned so I'm going to adapt in some way shape or form 
I may turn my heat down, I may not cook that side as much, or I may throw it all away and start over. Either way, it's going to be something adaptive based on having a bad outcome. So the adaptive response generation subprocess has two parts. We have the adaptive response mechanism and we have the adaptation gestalt. Okay, and this is where the response then is generated. So you'll see that occupational response, there's an arrow <clears throat> leading to that on your diagram. Again, here is a diagram or a visual. We're at the adaptive response generation subprocess. We have the adaptive response mechanism, which we're going to start talking about the three components to those, and you'll see how this kind of gets confusing because under each three components or constructs, um, we have um, other things listed underneath that. And then we have the adaptive gestalt or the... Um, adaptation gestalt um, here, which also has three components, which I'll talk about shortly. So looking at the response mechanism, it consists of three constructs, adaptive energy, adaptive response modes, and adaptive response behaviors. And so again, I have handwritten all of these things under adaptive response generation subprocess. These three constructs do not happen in any specific order, and there isn't a hierarchy, meaning one's not more important than the other. They're occurring all the time simultaneously. So <clears throat> the adaptive energy assumptions that we can make, or the adaptive energy, that's the first component or the first construct under adaptive response mechanism, um, this is what drives the process of how we do things. Um, we're looking at energy and there's a finite supply of energy which is present right away at birth. Um, but there's an upper limit to the amount of adaptive energy that can be used at any given point in time which is called a protective mechanism. Okay so if I'm going 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 um, with my running and with my training, there's going to reach a certain point in time when I have no energy anymore. And so my body kicks in and says, whoa, slow down, or you need to stop. And that's that protective mechanism so we don't extend too much energy at one given time. Now, a, thre a threshold of adaptation energy um, activation must be present to potentiate an occupational response. So meaning we have to have the lowest possible um, amount of energy also um, in order to engage in some sort of occupation. Um, so adaptive energy is active on two levels of awareness. Um, there's a primary level of awareness and a secondary level of awareness. The primary um, level of awareness has to focus or how we focus on occupations. Um, <clears throat> we may be feeling more press because it's not as familiar to us or what we're if it's in something new um, it might take um, it might take more energy from us. Um, I think of studying for an exam or um, with my PhD studies when I had um, a lot of papers due at one week um, it would take more energy for me to complete all of that stuff. Um, so looking at secondary, um, the energy is away from the occupation. It tends to be more, um, it tends to be more creative, maybe just taking up your time. So <clears throat> I may um, be doing something that I really enjoy doing, such as eating, okay? After cooking a big dinner um, and sitting down and eating, um, it's still taking energy, um, but it's, um, I'm enjoying myself as I'm doing it. So it's not as, um, it's not as labor intensive as you could say. <clears throat> Looking at the adaptive response um, mechanism, there also, or the second part, um, is modes. The adaptive response modes. So there are, these are patterns of responding to challenges that have developed with time and experience. So we all have 
existing modes, um, things that already exist in place. Um, tying shoes pretty much comes automatic to us in any way, shape, or form, okay? Um, when we, ha we also have modified modes. So this is where um, we may be doing something and we have to modify something in the given time, in a given time. So making grilled ham and cheese sandwiches or grilled cheese sandwiches and I'm burning the one side as I always do. Um, then I turn the heat down and flip the sandwich over and um, I'm modifying something, okay? Um, I'm making a change in something that I already know how to do. I know how to make grilled cheese sandwich, but when I'm burning it, I need to modify that mode. Um, new and adaptive responses or new and adaptive response modes, um, we modify it until we get it. So I think of um, when you are studying anatomy and you're studying a lot of different information um, all at one time. Um, some of you might be trying different things. Um, you might be modifying different ways of studying. Maybe some of you are increasing the length of time you study or increasing the number of days that you study instead of just one day, maybe you're studying a little bit every day. So maybe some of you make flashcards, maybe some of you um, study in groups and you probably experiment with all those different times or all those different studying methods um, to see what works for you. So an occupational challenge happens first. Um, and this, again, we're going back to the diagram. Um, happens first, um, and then the first thing that we're going to do is use what we know. We're going to use our existing mode. And so <clears throat> when that fails, then we're able to adapt and try different modes or try a modified mode or even a new adaptive response mode. And so we have these modes throughout our entire lifetime. Looking at the third component of adaptive response mechanism, we have adaptive response behaviors. And this is behavior types or classes that a person uses in an attempt to respond adaptively. So there are three different types or three classes. There's primitive, transitional, and mature. So with primitive, um, there is nothing, no adaptive movement that's needed. Um, we're hyper stable. We are um, same thing, we're doing the same thing. Basically, there's no change in our behavior that's needed. Um, with transitional, we're hypermobile. We're trying everything. We're panicking. There's no rhyme or reason. We have a high activity level. And what, and what we're doing, we're just trying random things, okay? Um, and it can be, very, it can be variable um, based on any given reason. Um, and then we have... A mature um, class, meaning that we're using a blended method of mobility and stability. Um, we're goal directed, and we're modulated. Um, so we're not panicking here. We're we're problem solving, and so we're most likely to produce an adaptive and masterful response that's appropriate because we're blending how much we move and and um, we're not panicked. We're we're more modulated. So what we can assume about the adaptive response mechanism is that all three classes of behaviors are always available um, in a person's behavior repertoire. And so we all naturally move around these three different classes. Um, transitional behaviors are characterized by variability in behavior. So when we're doing new behaviors or new occupations, um, we're going to transition between the, the three different types. Um, and sequence from moving to primitive to transitional to a mature occurs frequently when we have to adapt with what we're doing. Again, that, that reasoning that we're doing. Um, Hyperstability as a first response can be expected when a person faces a challenge that's overwhelming because we may say, oh, that doesn't apply to me or, um, oh, I don't want to deal with that anymore. You kind of shut down and, and it, doesn't let, it doesn't get under your skin so much. Now, the second process um, of the adaptive response generation subprocess is called the adaptive gestalt. 
Um, so again, this is the second part. Um, I drew kind of a, another little arrow off the adaptive response generation subprocess diagram. And what we assume here is that all three persons or all three people or all people have three different systems. There's a sensory motor system that looks at um, how we feel, how we move. Um, there's a cognitive portion or assumption that looks at how we learn, um, how we think. And then there's a psychosocial. So how are we interacting with others? And these are present in some degree in every occupation that we do in some way, shape, or form. Now, no one gestalt is better than the other. And when I say gestalt, I um, and I'll show a diagram here, but it's um, sort of a pie where you allocate certain amounts of your sensory motor, cognitive, and psychosocial based on what occupation you're doing. Um, some occupations require us to think more than to touch and to engage in other, um, engage with other people. Um, so based on that um, would change our gestalt. So gestalts that are not producing something productive, we need to change. So um, again, if we have to allocate more time to cognitive, um, then the sensory motor and psychosocial, something there has to give, something there has to modify. So <clears throat> on the left-hand side, we can see an example of a gestalt. So this is a person, um, we have sensory motor, cognitive, and psychosocial. Okay, now based on what, what occupation you do, um, I'm going to say we're going to engage in an occupation of taking an exam. Okay, so our gestalt here would have more cognitive portions because we're using our thinking um, when engaging in an exam or when taking an exam, um, we should have very little psychosocial activity while taking an exam, maybe a little bit with the instructor or the person next to you before or after the exam. Um, and sensory motor, you have a little bit more because you are maybe handing back tests, you're turning pages, you're filling out bubble sheets, those sorts of things. So this would be an example of a gestalt um, allocated with the, the three different types that make up a person um, based on taking an exam.